comes in. Hello, I'm Lori Brown, president of the geomagnetism, paleomagnetism, and electromagnetism section. And I'd like to welcome you all to the GPE 2017 Bullard Lecture. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to remind all of the GPE members that our annual reception and short business meeting will be um, directly after this talk, starting at 6.30 in the Hilton Riverside on the second floor in the um, Churchill Room C. So I hope to see you all there. It is my great honor to um, introduce Dr. Ken Kadama of Lehigh University, who will present this year's Bullard Lecture. Ken has a distinguished career um, in rock and paleomagnetism with a special emphasis on the accuracy of magnetic remnants, particularly in sedimentary deposits. He received his BA degree from the University of Pennsylvania in geology, went on to, the univers uh, to Stanford University, where he got his PhD under the late Alan Cox, and was then um, hired by Lehigh University, where he has been for almost 40 years. From his early work on plastic deformation in artificial sediments to his current studies in cyclostratigraphy, Ken has been interested in the accuracy of paleomagnetic signatures, both in the natural environment and in laboratory experiments. He also uses rock magnetism and um, paleomagnetism on sedimentary sequences to investigate climatic change and environmental changes through geologic time. He's a leading expert on the remnants in sedimentary rocks and has truly written the book on the subject in his 2012 volume, Paleomagnetism of Sedimentary Rocks. And the diagram here on his title page comes from the cover of that book. Um, Ken has published over 100 papers in a wide range of fields on magnetic topics. And he also has a very um, outstanding career as an educator of geophysicists, including um, undergraduate students, masters, and PhDs, many of whom are here today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the 2017 Bullard Lecturer, Ken Kadama. Thanks, Lori, and thanks for inviting me. And what I wanted to share with you today uh, was what's driven me for the last 40 years or so in my research. Um, uh, the passions I have, there's really two things, and Lori mentioned them already. One is the accuracy of sedimentary remnants. What, how accurate are uh, the paleomagnetic signals in, in sedimentary rocks? And then later, uh, more recently, I've become interested in measuring high resolution and time, uh, high resolution time in sedimentary rocks using magnetic uh, measurements. And as Lori said, this is the cover of my book from 2012, uh, paleomagnetism of sedimentary rocks. Um, and I wanted to just mention that my wife painted, Anna painted this cover, and uh, you'll see that her painting shows up in another book that I wrote a little bit later. So this first book, it does survey, try, I, I tried to survey the paleomagnetism of sedimentary rocks. It's a vast field, but I mainly concentrated on some of the work done to look at the accuracy of, of paleomagnetic remnants. So this started quite a while ago uh, in the 80s. I worked with some students. Glenn Anson was the first student. Gay Deemer was another uh, important worker in this. And what we did is we very slowly um, compacted sedimentary rocks, artificial sedimentary rocks that we had made in the lab and then uh, magnetized by stirring and very slowly dripped water into a tank to load them very slowly so that the water could escape. Uh, given these really low permeability rocks fairly slowly and we weren't overpressuring them. And what we saw, you can see, I don't know, do I have, uh, what you can, I don't have a, doesn't, oh, okay, right. What you can, what you can see over here is this is pressure and this is um, 
this is porosity, and what we saw was a two-stage behavior, a fast loss in porosity up to a certain pressure, and then a slower loss, a break in slope. We saw shallowing of the inclination, which was our goal, but we saw that it followed that change uh, in the compaction behavior in the lab. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, because another student came along, Wei Wei Sun, in the late 80s, early 90s, and he actually did, he did, he actually saw the magnetic particles in these sedimentary rocks. You can see the clay particles, and circled here in this JGR article we published, you can see the magnetite we put in, half micron long magnetite, sticking to the clay particles in a really high porosity sediment. This, this had to be very careful work that he did. We also looked at the remnants anisotropy as we compacted, and again, this is pressure down here, and we saw that two-stage behavior during compaction in the anisotropy, and from that, I want to go back. How do I go back? Shoot. Can you go back? Oh, well. What I wanted to show you was we developed a model uh, showing that as the sample compacted and the inclination shallowed, the uh, anisotropy also increased, all following. And, and the idea we came up with as the clay fabric formed, since the magnetite particles were stuck to the clay, then the shallowing in the fabric developed. Uh, and that's an important uh, thing to realize as we look, go into compaction corrections using the anisotropy. And what was really nice was uh, another student working with me, Jordan Vaughn, we worked down in Baja, California on the perforata formation, Cretaceous, had evidence of shallow inclinations, uh, we want, and was used as evidence for tectonic uh, terrains, tectonostratigraphic terrains. We wanted to check out that interpretation. And what we found was very nice. We found that different rocks in this formation had different degrees of anisotropy developed, both AMS and down here, anisotropy of remnants, uh, which I call anisotropy of anhistoretic remnants, but a lot of other people call it AARM. And what we saw was as the fabric became less and less developed in these different rocks we sampled, the inclination was steeper. And in fact, if we take these rocks here with the shallowest inclination in the most developed fabric and use that fabric to correct them, we come up with an inclination very close to the highest inclination that we saw in the formation. So this validated something that we had, had proposed from the laboratory compaction work, which was that you assume that the rock starts out with the right inclination acquired in the field at the time of deposition, and then as compaction goes forward, that inclination is shallowing, and, and you start with a very really low uh, fabric at the start. Of course, Mike Jackson already realized that. He wrote a beautiful paper in 91 where he said that you could correct for inclination shallowing in sedimentary rocks uh, by using this relationship from King way back in 1955. And there was uh, this F factor, which related the tangent of the inclination of the field or the initial inclination in the sediment to the measured inclination or the um, uh, compacted inclination. And what we added to that was that this, well, what Mike said was that the sample anisotropy, the bulk anisotropy, plus the individual particle anisotropy of the particles carrying the remnants, uh, are what contributes to this F factor, which then if you know that and you know this from measuring it, you can work your way back to the initial inclination. And I just found this. I think it works, yeah. Anyway, uh, Lisa and Dennis, Lisa Tokes and Dennis Kent came up with a total, totally different way of getting at F, that important factor relating the initial inclination before compaction shallowing and the compacted inclination by looking simply at the directional distribution of directions. You need a lot of directions to do that. <clears throat> and t we saw this already in, in rocks in uh, China, looking at it, Zedan Tang worked on those rocks in China, where we saw the directional distribution was flattened east-west. Well, Lisa realized that you could undo it by trying different F factors until you got back to the uh, distribution, the elongation 
uh, north-south elongation of the dis directional distribution that would match a model of the field. And here's their TK03 GAD model, uh, geo, you know, geocentric axial dipole model of the field. So Lisa and Dennis came up with a totally different way of getting at that F vector for correcting the inclination shallowing. We compared the two techniques with a set of formations, the Nascimento formation, Paleocene, the Nanaimo group, and we got pretty much the same F factor, so which would suggest that going at this totally independently, we come up with, with the same kind of correction. There are other, in the book, I, I surveyed the literature, and there are other examples, though, where the EI technique tends to overdo the correction. So the anisotropy correction would be the most conservative approach. There's different things that can affect both approaches to correcting the inclination. Uh, and it's always important to think about the geology as, as you do that. Um, so one thing I found out from putting the book together was if you look at all the inclination shallowing studies in the literature at that time about five years ago, about 85% of the rocks studied uh, showed some significant amount of inclination shallowing. So the point of this is it happens. It's more likely to happen than not to happen, and we should always be thinking about it and thinking about getting at it uh, correctly to correct for that. Um, in, if you can read this, in the 18 anisotropy studies at that time, only one, only two, can't read it, had uh, had F values close to one, which would mean no shallowing. And of the 22 EI studies using that approach to it, four had F values greater than 0.9. Uh, and also, this is in the book too, that if you look at the particular, litho uh, the particular magnetic mineralogy carrying the magnetism in the sediments, magnetite and hematite, as you might expect, because they have different shapes, um, typically, uh, have in the literature, they show slightly different amounts of, of shallowing. So what does this mean for paleogeographic reconstructions? Of course, it's, this is the inclination is the central piece of data used for reconstructing the paleo latitude. So of course, it's going to have a big effect on paleogeographic reconstructions. I had this figure. I just wanted to show that how much of the paleozoic and mesozoic part of the uh, of the, this is Rob Vanderboo's old apparent polar wander path for North America, how much of it is carried by red beds, which are also, you may not think so, but I found out in, in, in researching the book that they suffer from inclination shallowing too. And Dennis Kent and Ted Irving did a, a beautiful study in 2010 where they looked at just, I believe, the Mesozoic part of the North American pole path and they found that it was carried by a lot of sedimentary rocks compared to igneous rocks. They redid the pole path uh, based on uh, correcting the sedimentary rock inclination and using the igneous rocks, which don't suffer from inclination shallowing. And they got a totally different pole path for North America and this incredible monster shift, I think Dennis calls it, uh, which, which, came, which became observable uh, only after taking care of inclination shallowing. So I think the takeaway message is if you, if, if you work with sedimentary rocks, you have to consider this. And I think a lot of people are doing that uh, these days, which is great. So now I'm going to go on to something completely different. Oh, no, I should mention that Dario Billardello, who worked with me, uh, also worked on the pole path and correcting the paleogeographic reconstructions. This is Carboniferous rocks. We worked in North America. We found when we corrected the Carboniferous for North America, it would overlap with uh, southern continents with Gondwana, and you need to correct everything to get it to work. And I just wanted to mention Dario's work. Uh, he, he did a lot of great work with inclination shallowing corrections, too. But I think the main part of the talk is uh, about this rock magnetic cyclostratigraphy, which I've been working on over the last several years. And Anna painted this cover too. And you'll notice that it's blue as opposed to orange and yellow. And it's got the moon and not the sun. At, at the time, 
I wrote this book with Linda Hinoff on, on, on rock magnetic cyclostratigraphy, uh, which came out a couple years after the orange book. Um, we were finding that carbonates, that limestones, seem to give the best cyclostratigraphic results. And so these are limestones. And of course, the moon is important in driving two of the astronomical cycles that we're interested in, in detecting in these sedimentary rocks. Uh, and uh, that's precession and uh, obliquity. So that's why we have the moon and we have the blue rocks. So I became interested in time uh, after I'd worked on inclination shelling. I became particularly interested in time. And of course, the standard way that a paleomagnetist or records time in a sedimentary sequence is by looking at the magnetostratigraphy, recognizing uh, the reversals of the Earth's magnetic field and tying it to the geomagnetic polarity time scale. And since this is a Ballard talk, I thought I should mention Edward Ballard, who is one of the founders or first doing dynamo theory, which helps us understand the Earth's magnetic field, how it's generated. So there he is. Now, if we want to get really high resolution, you certainly want to use uh, geomagnetic polarity uh, to, to look at it. But there's different times in the time scale when you'll get better resolution than others. And during the, you know, during the late Cenozoic, you might be able to get resolution of 10 to the fifth years. Uh, but in the Cretaceous, obviously, you don't get any resolution. So it's very dependent upon the age of the rocks. And the best you can do is about 100,000 years. Oh, darn. OK. I should also mention that uh, you can use relative paleo intensity in sedimentary rocks. A lot of people have done really good work on, on that. This is from uh, Lisa's work and also Guido and Valet. Uh, that's good. You need really good depositional marine conditions to get that. And that's calibrated maybe back a million years or so. Uh, so let's see if we can, we can expand our range of time and increase our resolution. Uh, geologists for a long time had been looking at lithologic cyclostratigraphy. Um, they had looked at facies changes in rocks and saw repeating patterns and tied that to astronomically forced climate cycles in the past. Um, I'm going to show you that I think rock magnetics can do an even better job than the facies than the lithologic cyclostratigraphy. I'll show you that a little bit later because it's a very sensitive tool uh, looking at changes in source area and, and depositional environment. Of course, what we're looking for are target frequencies in doing this cyclostratigraphy are the Milankovitch cycles, the uh, astronomically, the changes, astronomically forced changes in solar insulation, changes in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit around the sun, and also the wobble of the Earth's rotational axis to the plane of the ecliptic and the, the tilt, the obliquity. And all these cycles are driven by driven by change in, by the moon, the tidal drag of the moon, the obliquity in the last several million years is 41,000 years. Uh, there's a braided processional change, the wobble of the Earth's axis in space, changing the pole star through time, 24, 22, 19 kilo years. And over here we have the changes in the eccentricity with periods around 404, 405, and also the short eccentricity, which I'll refer to as maybe about 125, 95 braided. These are driven, as far as I can tell from reading literature, by the large planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, whereas these are driven pretty much by the, the gravitational pull of the sun, of the moon, rather, not the sun, the moon. Uh, and what's interesting uh, is that if you go back in time, the moon was closer to the Earth, there was a greater pull, and these periods get shorter as you go back in geologic time. So our targets, you have to realize, these targets probably play pretty, uh, stay pretty stable, and these targets uh, will change back into Earth history. So let me give you an example before we get to the main thrust of the talk. Uh, of, of a rock magnetic cyclostratigraphic study that worked really well. 
and it kind of outlines the basic procedures I think you need to do to do a good study. And I worked with Dave Anastasio, Josep Perez, Linda Hinoff, and the student Michael Newton on this project. It's published in GQ a little while ago. And basically, the, the goal of the study was to look at this structure, this salt tectonics anticline in the Pyrenees, and try to have high resolution time so we can look at changes in the deformation rate, how fast this folded in time. And the depositional environment is a deltaic environment. Here's a close up. And what we did is we used GPS to accurately locate our positions, of our sampling positions uh, of these, of these um, beds that are growth strata around this anticline. So the growth strata are going to record the growth of this anticline. And our job was to put high resolution time on these growth strata. And that's what they look like. They're carbonate. They're marls. And of course, the first thing we wanted to do was to assign absolute time, get a rough idea of the sediment accumulation rate, because that dictates pretty much everything in identifying cycles and even, our, even the sampling interval. Um, and so, Joseph, here's Joseph, and we went in and we sampled and we got a pretty detailed magnetostratigraphy, a reconnaissance cycle uh, magnetostratigraphy had been done before by Hogan and Burbank, but we went in and did much more high resolution work, tied it to the uh, geomagnetic polarity time scale, as you would. And here is a section, a stratigraphic section, and what you see, what well, you can't tell, but if you could read this legend, you would see that it starts out very fine-grained, it gets coarser-grained as you go up section. We had 800 meters of section. We varied our sampling interval. Here we knew the sediment accumulation rate was probably much slower than up here at the coarser grain part. But it was all pretty much meter to submeter sampling intervals, uh, all the way through a whole 800 meters of section. You don't have to orient the cores, but you do have to know, you know exactly where you are in the section. So you have to measure section to do this. And this is the ARM. And so what we're looking at simply is the variations in the concentration of the magnetic minerals. And you can just see by eye that you can see a hierarchy of, of different cycles. You can see high frequency stuff and lower frequency stuff. And this is the primary data set. And and what you see here is here is that ARM time series. Here we have the magnetostratigraphy tied to the geomagnetic polarity time scale. And so that when we do the time series analysis of this ARM time series, we know pretty much what these different peaks are. The 30 meter peak, and this is MTM analysis, multi-taper method, and these are the confidence intervals above the robust red noise. Uh, so if you see peaks sticking up above the 99% confid confidence interval, you're pretty clear that you, you've got a significant peak in, in the data. And that works out from the average sediment accumulation rate we got from the magnetostratigraphy, which is there, to be 133 kiloyears, which is very close to short eccentricity. And then there's power down here at five meter cycles, which are down in the processional band of 20, 22, 20,000 years. But there's also peaks that we don't quite know what we're doing with. There's 63,000 years here. There's a peak at 356 kiloyears, which is kind of close to the 405, but quite not, not quite there yet. And a peak at about 200,000. So I already showed you that the, sed that the grain size varies up section, so the sediment accumulation rate probably varies. And there's probably missing section, little diastems, things like that. So what we did then was we tuned it. And some people say, oh, well, you're just making up, you know, you're, you're giving yourself cycles by tuning. But it's not quite that simple because we are, I think I already demonstrated from the, from the magnetostratigraphy that we do have cycles there at the expected, uh, expected frequencies for Milankovitch cycles. What we want is to develop a really high resolution chronostratigraphy. So here's our data again. And here's the theoretical eccentricity 
And you can see that you have, this is the 100,000 year peaks and they're bundled in 400,000 year groups as you would expect. And we just tie them by I and so now we've stretched and, and contracted that ARM time series to fit this first tuning to theoretical eccentricity. And then here we filter the data at that what we think is 100,000 years and then we tie it again and we end up with twice tuned uh, ARM spectrum. So what's the test if this was good? Did we pick our cycles correctly? And here's the time series again. Of course, we see beautiful 94, as you might expect, because there's that 100,000 we tuned to. So that's no surprise. It brought out the 125 a little better. It changed that 356 to the 400,000 but maybe that's not so unexpected because we did tune here. The real test is precession, and we have beautiful precessional periodicities from that record, uh, maybe even uh, sub Milankovitch, I'm not sure. And that 63,000 year peak, which we didn't know quite what to do with, kind of disappeared or uh, got below the noise level. So I think this is an example of how you can really do a nice uh, chronostratigraphy and I'll give you an example here. There's what you would get from just the reversal boundaries in terms of the time, putting time on that section. And this is the sediment accumulation rate through time for that, for that particular section. So using this, we have high resolution time, which we can then look at the deformation uh, recorded by the growth strata. So that's, that's a rock magnetic cyclostratigraphy study that worked pretty well. Oh, one other thing that's really interesting, this is something Linda Hinoff did. This is called a coherency analysis. We tuned here, we're comparing our data, our tuned data to the theoretical here in a coherency. And of course we tuned at the eccentricity band, and so that's coherent, that's no, but we're also coherent at the processional band. There's a processional frequencies. And the procession changes its phase during the year. This was hard for me to believe, but we can get that our ARM tuned to eccentricity, the procession is in phase with the theoretical procession in the fall in September, October, and November. So one thing I failed to mention is you really want to know how does this work? If you're going to be looking at rock magnetics to, to detect these Milankovitch cycles and create chronostratigraphy, how do you, how, what's the mechanism for doing that? Uh, what is the Earth doing? Well, here we have, from the data, we have that the ARM peaks in precession are in phase with precession in the fall, which for this particular uh, formation, it's in a... Uh, low latitude based on the paleomagnetism in the Eocene. Uh, this is a monsoonal environment. There's a rainy season and the peaks in ARM to be, appear to be in phase with the rainy season. And so based on that we argue that the mechanism for encoding the climate signal using the rock magnetics is simply a runoff from the continent into a fairly constant production of carbonate in, in the the shallow marine environment. So that's our understanding of how that record gets uh, put in, uh, recorded, a record gets recorded. So here's some just from this first study, the Arguis formation uh, shows the presence of the cycles and it can give you a high resolution uh, sediment accumulation rates. Well the real focus of the talk is work that my students and I have done and looking at the duration of a carbon isotope excursion in Ediacaran age rocks and it's called the Sherm excursion and this is from a paper back in 2006 and what this excursion is is a major shift, negative shift in the carbon isotopes in marine sediments. It's the largest shift in earth history. It goes down to about minus 12 and it's recognized all over the world, and the type locality, if you will, is in Oman. Uh, it's also in South Australia, in Death Valley, California, Namibia, and in South China. And so, 
Why is this an important thing to look at? Well, this occurred just before the explosion of multicellular life at about 543 million years. Um, and this is from one of the slides that Daniel Minguez, who worked on it with me, made, but it, it shows it's the boring billion. For billions of years, life was pretty boring, I guess. And then things stepped up here at the uh, basal cambrium. And so there w was some idea, some people say that the Shuram excursion is a record of the oxidation of the gl early global ocean. Um, and that has some problems because the original estimates for the duration of the Shuram excursion were 30 to 50 million years based on a simply a carbon, a, a continental margin cooling model in Oman. Uh, and it was hard for the geochemists to have enough oxidants to oxidize and maintain this uh, carbon isotope excursion for 30 to 50 million years. And there is also the problem, there's many people who suggest it's not a primary feature. That it's due to diagenesis, there is a correlation between the oxygen isotopes and the carbon isotopes in many formations occurring the Shuram excursion. And so we wanted to get at both the duration and hope and help with the argument about whether or not uh, it's a primary feature which would record the oxidation of the world ocean before the explosion of multicellular life. And this is from a paper by Fike et al. And you can see that he's overlaid the excursion from different places in the globe and they all have pretty much the same shape. So this is the work uh, of Daniel Minguez who did a PhD with me a couple of years ago. And this is the Johnny Formation in, in uh, the particular locality you see here is Winter Pass Hills. It carries the Sherm excursion. Uh, here you can see we had two localities in the Nopal Range and Winter's Pass Hills in the eastern part of Death Valley. The whole excursion is recorded in the Panamint Mountains over on the western side, but it's amphibolite, amphibolite grade uh, metamorphic rocks, so we can't really do much paleomag or mag rock magnetics over there. We have a little bit of the excursion in the eastern part of Death Valley. I wanted to show you this picture of the rocks in the Nopal Range. They're red, and right away as a paleomagnetist you think, hmm, hematite, and is it a primary magnetic mineral or not? But interestingly enough, when we did the thermal DMAG, I worked with Jack Hillhouse on this work, the, the temperatures at which the magnetization is removed are magnetite temperatures. So there is magnetite in there. Uh, we have these Ziderfeld diagrams, vector endpoint diagrams, which trend beautifully linearly into the origin. So we're able to get pretty good paleomagnetic results from these rocks. And of course, we do rock magnetics. I would have to throw in some rock magnetics. We have IRM acquisition and thermal DMAG of the IRM, uh, modeling of the IRM acquisition, all suggesting that we have, do have a low corrosivity phase, which is probably consistent with magnetite. But nothing in the Precambrian is that easy, and it's pretty scattered data. There seems to be a t uh, overprint up to about 500 degrees. Um, we can detect different polarities, and the poles that we get from these shallow east-west directions are what you would expect. They give poles what you'd expect for North America at this time period, which is about 550 million years. Uh, this is to show you that there's a marker bed at the base of the rainstorm member of the Johnny Formation where, where the excursion is recorded. It's called the Johnny Uolite, and that acts as a marker bed at all these localities. We took the data as we saw it and we were able to construct magnetostratigraphy and we can see at these locations and another location done by other workers a long time ago by Van Alstein and Gillette that we can correlate the magnetostratigraphy and it's all tied of course to this um, Johnny Uolite uh, at, at the base of the, the section. Now, of course, the big problem you're probably saying is, well, there's no geomagnetic polarity time scale back in the Precambrian. 
So we couldn't tie it to time that way, and we couldn't get an average sediment accumulation rate. What we have is simply a polarity stratigraphy, and we assume that uh, we get a rough idea of the amount of time. I realize the Ediacaran is, may be a, not a time to do that because some people argue that there are fast reversal rates at that time. But let me, let me go on and see if I can convince you we did this right. Here is the susceptibility time series, not ARM. We sampled these rocks about every quarter meter, 25 centimeters, and we did the spectral analysis and we see peaks which based on our rough idea of time, we believe are short eccentricity, five meter peak, eight meter peak. We see obliquity showing up at the right place for the Ediacaran. We see in some cases precession showing up, in other places precession was a little bit shorter than what we expected. And of course we don't know the theoretical uh, uh, theoretical cyclostratigraphy at that time, theoretical cycles way back in the Precambrian. Uh, there are some estimates of it, but it's, it, it may be more of a chaotic situation that you can't tell, but in any event, we think we've got it, and based on this analysis and picking these as eccentricity and obliquity, we get a duration, and remember it's extrapolated because we don't have the whole excursion of 8.2 plus or minus 1.2 million years for the Shuram excursion. But what we did find, and this was serendipitous, is we did find this normal event, and this normal event at the base of the section starts right at the lowest point within stratigraphic uncertainty, at the lowest point of the Shuram excursion. And not only that, these two different localities, if you take our cycles, at the two different localities, these, this normal event is the same duration. Okay, it's about 400,000 years in duration. So at least within two localities in Death Valley, we see synchronicity. We see the lowest part of the excursion. These are our carbon isotope measurements uh, at the nadir of the, of the excursion. So I think that's, that's pretty positive. So let's go someplace else in the world, to South Australia. We worked with Phil Schmidt on this. Daniel worked on these rocks in South Australia. Uh, we knew that the Shuram excursion was there from work, previous work by Calver. And what's really unique about this is that we have the whole excursion accessible to us, all 600 meters of it in South Australia. We did magnetostratigraphy, but we had, of course, the whole excursion. These are our data. Uh, they are hematite. Uh, they come off at hematite temperatures. But we got a beautiful uh, magnetostratigraphy throughout the 600, almost 600 meters of the section. Um, and Phil Schmidt and George, um, George Williams have worked in a neighboring gorge and got a, a similar magnetostratigraphy. And then, of course, one of the things you have to deal with in looking at the polarity is there's an ambiguity about the polarity way back in the Idiocaran. And I use Phil Schmidt's and George Williams' uh, reconstructions of where Australia was at that time to pick this as the normal polarity and this is the reverse polarity, which happens to put a normal polarity event right at the base of the section, near the base of the section. So here's the cyclostratigraphy. Now remember, the other in Death Valley, we had to extrapolate. We got 8.2 million years for the duration, quite a bit less than what um, the estimate was, 30 to 50 million years. And this is an evolutionary spectrogram. We had to break the section into different parts because of different uh, cyclostratigraphic behavior, different lithologies, and these are the, the spectra you see for these different sections, three sections of the whole 600 meters. But you can see that in this evolutionary spectrogram that what we think is long eccentricity continues pretty much right through the section and we see power at short eccentricity and we see power at precession and sometimes even obliquity. 
And you can see from the susceptibility data, this long susceptibility time series, that we have a hierarchy of cycles we have. You can see the cycles in it. We have long period cycles and, and short period cycles. And based on our picking of these cycles, we get a duration of 8 million plus or minus 0.5 million years, which agrees beautifully uh, with what we saw at Death Valley. And the other thing which was very nice was, remember in Death Valley, we saw the nadir occurring right at the beginning of that normal polarity event, which was 400,000 years in duration. We see that the nadir in Australia occurs right at the base of a normal event, which is about 400,000 years in duration. So now, I think we've provided evidence, this was published in geology this year, that we have synchronous uh, behavior of, the, of this excursion and the same duration at two different globally separated localities. And so that would support a primary, uh, a primary source for the SRAM. So then one, one, the last place we went, I'll get through this pretty quickly, was South China. The Dushantou Formation was a carbonate platform deposit throughout China uh, where Zhu et al. has shown that there we have this carbon isotope excursion in, in many different localities. We picked this particular, we picked this particular locality, uh, the Vedetian Tandahe location, where the excursion is a little bit not as thick as in Australia. Remember, in Australia it's 600 meters thick. Here it's 100, maybe 150 meters thick in the section. Locality we went to is in South China near Kunming. I worked with Frank Lee. I should have mentioned that, Young Sun Lee and Zheng Gong on this. It was Zheng Gong's master's thesis, and uh, Young Sun Lee helped us immensely in the field. And Zheng measured not only magnetic susceptibility, we redid, of course, the carbon isotopes. We knew exactly where we were in the excursion. Here's the magnetic susceptibility. Here's the ARM. And when we did the time series analysis of this, we saw beautiful significant peaks at about 400 centimeters. We knew it probably was a much slower sediment accumulation rate uh, based on the thickness of the excursion. So we sampled every 10 centimeters for 50 or 60 meters or more of section. Uh, and both the ARM and the MTM and the magnetic susceptibility using MTM analysis, we see a peak at 400. We see peaks down here at 20 centimeters. Uh, just remember there's a Nyquist frequency for sampling for time series analysis. You need to sample one period at least twice. So we were just at the limit when we were sampling at about 10 or 8 centimeters. And we might see even evidence, oh, oh this is probably short eccentricity at about 85 and 120 uh, centimeters. The duration we get as, as we make these picks is consistent with un, within uncertainty of the 8 million years, 8.2 million years, 9.1 million years. Now in South China, we can see there is, again, in the data, just by eyeballing it, we see there's different frequency cycles in the data. And one way of checking our pick is what's called amplitude modulation analysis, and that is where we look at the envelope of, we filter the data at what we think is precession, about 20 centimeters in this case. And we look at the envelope, and that should be the modulating eccentricity. Eccentricity modulates precession. And then we did time series analysis on the envelope, and we see periodicities which fit with eccentricity. I can't read it from here, but we have 80, 100 centimeters. But we also see some of the longer eccentricity periods. Of course, we see 400, we see 600, and we see 2 million. So I think that's pretty good evidence that we picked things right. But what was troubling in this particular study, just to show you some of the pitfalls, is that the direction we got from the paleomag, we want, of course, to do magnetostratigraphy, was not what other people had seen for the Duchanteau formation. In fact, it looked like it had been remagnetized in the Cretaceous, and there was orogenies in this area in the Cretaceous, and there is evidence of a lot of remagnetization in this area. 
the pole falls on the Cretaceous part of South China's pole path. So what's going on? I just gave you evidence. I think that the magnetic minerals record a depositional event. They record uh, climate during the, um, during the uh, Ediacaran. Um, so how do I explain that away? Uh, so we looked at the rock magnetics, did, low, uh, did uh, susceptibility versus temperature. We found magnetite. These are Lori tests where we gave orthogonal IRMs and thermally demagged, and it came off at magnetite temperatures. IRM acquisition and its modeling suggests low coercivity phases consistent with magnetite, okay, which is a primary depositional mineral. That's good. And here's some more evidence, ARM spectrum, partial ARM spectrum with pretty low coercivities consistent with, based on Mike Jackson's old work, the, the consistent with the grain size, which we saw in the SEM. And these SEM magnetite grains, they have iron peaks, look detrital. So our argument, at least in the paper, uh, is that we have a uh, original detrital magnetite which has been thermal viscously remagnetized in the Cretaceous. And so it can still record depositional processes, but its paleomag has been remagnetized. So what can we learn from all this is that the Sharam excursion is about eight to nine million years in duration, and its nadir is synchronous globally based on that normal event. And also, I'm, I'm trying to convince you that astronomically forced climate cycles can be recognized on by rock magnetics, even in Neoproterozoic rocks. Okay, so we've worked in limestones. It seems to work pretty well. One last thing, a new stuff that uh, hasn't been shown around too much. Uh, Marta Anson helped me on this when she was visiting Lehigh. We're going to look at a totally different depositional environment, a fluvial environment with red beds in the Mississippian, the Ma Chunk Formation. There's a classic outcrop of it, which you can see here in this Google Earth image in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Why did I want to go there? Well, first of all, it's really close to Lehigh. It's only about a 45-minute drive. But more than that, Neil Opdyke and Vic Devenier years ago did a beautiful magnetostratigraphic study of this particular outcrop. And also, the geologists have worked very carefully. You can see it's a fluvial environment. You have overbank deposits, channel deposits. You have red beds, uh, red muds, overbank deposits, and, and channel sandstones. So we, we know the changes in lithology, obviously, but we also have a beautiful control on time. And subsequent to that work in the early 90s, that particular normal event where we measured the cyclostratigraphy shows up in Gradstein's time scale. It's been correlated by polynology throughout eastern North America, okay? And we have a rough idea based on the tide of the time scale what the sediment accumulation rate is. It's on the order of 10 centimeters per kill year. So we also, there, you can buy these things. I'm not a salesperson for them, but you can buy these, these portable susceptibility meters. And we had used these in Australia. There's Daniel using it, and our field assistant, Julie Lussell, who I believe is in this room. But in any event, we, you, can, you can get a, a rough idea of, of the cyclostratigraphy even before you take the samples home to measure them. Uh, and we did that in Australia. It worked pretty good. So I wanted to really check it out even in more detail here. And here on the left is the portable susceptibility meter. That's the susceptibility throughout about 70 meters of section sampled uh, every half meter. And this is where we, chunk, we, at the exact same place we measured them, we whacked off a piece of sample, we took it back home, we measured its mass, we measured its susceptibility in a Kappa bridge, which is a very accurate instrument for doing that. And you can see the time series, eh, they don't look exactly alike, but they both, show, uh, they both show cycles, hierarchies of cycles. Down here, this is the lithology along our section. These grayer patches are, sandsto are sandstones, and the lighter patches are the red shales. And what I want to point out to you is, even though this is all one facies, the overbank deposit, you see structure 
in either of these records within it so that the magnetics are able to detect what I believe are, are astronomically forced cycles independently of the facies. So here's the, here are the evolutionary spectrograms. Here's the peaks on the left, the portable susceptibility meter. On the right, the Kappa bridge measurements. You see the same cycles. You see a six or seven meter cycle here. Over here, you see a seven meter cycle. You see a 1.8, you see 1.9, and you see cycles down around 1.1, 1.2 meters. So you can just play a game where you can say, okay, I will assign this peak here to 95 kiloyears. This one turns out to be beautifully about 125. This one turns out to be about 30 kiloyears, which is obliquity in the Carboniferous at 330 million years ago. And then you see this 1.1, 1.2 cycle are where you expect precession to be in the Carboniferous. And you can see that throughout the section, you have pretty stable eccentricity, what we believe is eccentricity, and that the precession and obliquity comes in and out. So, but think about this. You wouldn't expect necessarily, my geolo geologist friends are, are, are amazed at this because think of the depositional environment, fairly discontinuous sedimentation. You have a, a channel migrating back and forth across the floodplain, yet we're able to detect and also, paleomagnets say, wait, you're dealing with red beds, hematite. What's going on here? That may not be a depositional mineral. Yet we see these cycles. I use Steve Meyer's Astrocon software, which does an inversion and, and picks the sediment accumulation rate based on target, giving target uh, cycles, the, the eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. And it beautifully fits something just exactly what we did by eye about five or six centimeters per kiloyear is the sediment accumulation rate for this section. So I always want to know, and people have asked me, so what's, how does, how does, how does red beds in a fluvial environment record uh, cycles? So here's some temperature uh, versus susceptibility versus temperature on the Kappa bridge. We see that we have hematite, maybe a little magnetite. We certainly magne make magnetite on the cooling. But one thing you can do on low temperature measurements on the Kappa bridge is you can figure out this is susceptibility carrying the signal. What's, what is the mineral carrying the susceptibility variations? Is it the ferromagnetics? Is it the paramagnetics? And so I was able to, for a suite of samples, for part of the samples, here's the red is the bulk susceptibility variations. Remember, we've identified six or seven meters, maybe 22 meters as short eccentricity, long eccentricity, and 1.9 or 1 meter as obliquity and precession. And I picked a part of the section where the bulk susceptibility is, is decreasing like this, and what I found was totally unexpected. This blue curve is the percent of ferromagnetics in the carrying the magnetic susceptibility. And you can see that the short frequency cycles, which would be the ferromagnetics, uh, are the ferromagnetics, and the longer trend here, which would be the seven, eight, ten meter cycles, are the paramagnetics. And so I think you have both changes in the source area, the ferromagnetics, how much hematite is coming in, and changes in the environment of deposition, the paramagnetics, the, the, the clay content, appear to both encode climate for this particular formation. So there you have it. Uh, rock magnetics can detect astronomically forced climate cycles and sedimentary sequences, and it gives you a high-resolution chronostratigraphy for sedimentary rocks. And then just harking back to the beginning of the talk, in many cases, paleomagnetic inclination of sedimentary rocks is flattened by compaction and must be corrected. Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions, and I think that there's some active mics if you want to get up and ask a question. Do we have any, or any loud people? <laughs> any questions for Ken? I can hardly see up I've there. stunned you into oh, silence there. There's one. Yes? No. No, I can't hear you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm afraid you only might just be able to see. Yeah. Hi, um, great presentation. Uh, I was actually at your uh, your GSA presentation where you, where you talked about the um, uh, the the, the uh, so I forget the name of the formation you just said the one Sh that was the in the SRAM. Huh? Where, which, which Australia, China? Oh, the the one that was in near Lehigh University. Oh, uh, the, the red bed sequence, the Pottsville. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Thank you, the Pottsville. Yeah. Um, so I remember what you mentioned there because uh, in your book you, you uh, for magnetic psychostratigraphy you talk a lot about um, uh, the need for some kind of independent time scale, which is usually magnetostratigraphy, for, but for this case, since it was during, it was either long reverse or long normal used fossils. So I guess, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, or, yeah. so, so I guess my question would be like, uh, for example, like in the Colorado Plateau, where you have some red beds where uh, completely devoid of fossils, but yeah. might be a good candidate for psychostratigraphy, what would you recommend as a good independent age uh, constraint, or well, should you just not do it there? Uh, yeah, that, that's a hard one. and. Remember it, those red beds at that site. Yeah, I think it was it was correlated with the palynology, um, but that's all throughout Eastern North America. But the time scale. I mean, if you look at Gradstein, Gradstein, it goes back to the Carboniferous. Uh, but are you in the Cretaceous? You said. Uh, well, I mean, just uh, looking at maybe one even like in the Permian during that long reversal. If that yeah, was, that's if that a was problem. Possible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need, you need some way of estimating sediment accumulation rate. Right. The other thing people do is they look at ratios of cycles, and that's what I was trying to show you um, in the Ma Chung stuff. You could look at the ratio. If you pick this as, as short eccentricity, what does it predict for the other peaks you see? And if they fall in the uh, you know, Milankovitch band, well, then you're, you're given some uh, hope that you're picked it correctly. And you can do the amplitude modulation analysis, too, where you look at what you think is precession and look what modulates it and see if it turns out to be eccentricity, which it should. And then, of course, Steve Myers has done a lot of work on this, and he has beautiful programs, Astrocron, which will do a lot of this for you. So I recommend that you check out his, his software and his publications. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, if not, before we, we leave and head over to the reception, I just want to present Ken with a nice plaque and appreciation of presenting the bullet uh, lecture for us this year. So we're going to have another round of applause. We don't have any. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>